So in 1967, there was a futurist that uh, believed that the, one of the main problems that we were going to experience would be that we would have too much time on our hands. In fact, in fact, this futurist uh, went in 1985 went before a Senate subcommittee and actually uh, said that they believed that the average work week for Americans would be 22 hours a week. And we would have to figure out what to do with all of that time. Right. Well, you know, now America leads the industrialized wor uh, world in hours worked per week. The average is well over 50 plus per week. And then pair that with just this time of season. The busyness that you and me experience just this time of year. Maybe that's because of everything we have scheduled. Maybe that's because our ego just keeps scheduling things. But everybody's in a hurry. Everything is open, extra long, right? And if it's not, we just go on our phone and we shop there. But we're constantly in a hurry. And the busyness of this season, the busyness of this culture hasn't just been exported to the church, it's also been exported into your own home. So what do we do with that? We want to have the best Christmas ever, but for some of us it's just difficult because of how busy we feel, the demands of life. I mean, it's easy to get overwhelmed because of these demands. We're tired all the time, but we're sleeping less. There's this compulsive desire to be on the go all the time. There's Anxiety that's just consistent about the future. We're busy, but we're restless. We have a ton of acquaintances, but not many deep, healthy relationships. We're afraid of getting stuck, so we just keep scheduling things to keep us moving, right? But we also live in a time where there are more opportunities in front of us than ever before in history. Whether you're a youth or a senior or it's leisure or travel or education or the church, there's constant opportunities that are pushing up against us. And then with all of these astonishing opportunities before us, it actually creates a complexity to our life that from a day-to-day -day perspective just becomes unmanageable for many of us. And we have days that, that we try to fit things in that we couldn't fit in in a 36-hour Day. And for many of us, as we try to manage this busyness and this complexity, we, we kind of make this excuse in the back of our mind that, I mean, at some point it'll slow down, right? When my kids are out of the house, or if I get a new job, or a new boss, or if I become the boss, or, you know, when, when I'm done with school, after the season, when I make more money, but the reality is, is we just continue to minimize the margin in our life. We take away that sacred space that God has given us just to consider who He is, just to rest in who He is, to enjoy this sovereign Lord that we have the opportunity to serve. I, I saw a a great quote last night by Elizabeth Elliot. It says, Rest is a weapon given to us by God. The enemy hates it because he wants you to stay stressed and occupied. How true is that? Richard Swinson, in his book Margin, which is an excellent book, by the way, he talks about how margin is the space between our load and our limit. The space between our load and our limit. So when, when I fill up my load so much, it, it pushes up against my, my personal, physical, emotional, spiritual limits. I put so much on my plate that then when the problem is when something that I'm not planning on happens, then it really pushes up against my limit. And it's there when, you're, when your load pushes up against your limit that we have the tendency to compromise. I mean, we don't schedule for challenges in our life. And the, the compromise 
isn't always a moral compromise, but it's always a relational compromise. And in a season where we ought to be celebrating the primary relationship that God has brought into our life, as well as the other relationships that we have in our life, the thing that gets compromised the most when we don't rest, when we don't allow for margin, is relationships. So we don't listen very well because we're too busy with work. We don't love very well because we've got to get the job done. We, we don't serve very well because we're constantly striving to, to serve ourselves. And when my load is exceeding my limit, we compromise relationships. So listen, we want to have the best Christmas ever. We want to minimize the schedule so that we can have margin to rest in the King of Kings. Well, we've been going through Isaiah chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles real quick, turn to Isaiah chapter 9 and this incredible prophecy that foretells the coming Messiah. And we're connecting what this prophecy says with, with what the Christmas story talks about with this Messiah. And here we have in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So last week we talked about him as wonderful counselor. This idea of wonderful counselor, he is a personal counselor. It's God with us. He, he hasn't just created us and he, he hasn't stepped away from the earth and just going, way to go, earth people. No, he, he, God sent his son Jesus to walk with us, to live with us. John 1 says to tabernacle with us, to take up residence with us. God is with us. This beautiful picture of a wonderful counselor. Now, uh, Isaiah the prophet is saying he is not only a wonderful counselor, but he is a mighty God and an everlasting father. I love, you've heard me say this before, I love that the word mighty God in Hebrew is El Gabor, and if I ever have a Mexican food restaurant, I'm calling it El Gabor. And, but mighty God and everlasting father. And it says that the government and at that point, we can just make the assumption that everything rests on his shoulders. Because he's a mighty God. He's an everlasting father. He is sovereign in every way. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. And, and, and confession, the reason why I overschedule things most of the time is because I think it rests on my shoulders. I don't know about you. But here, Isaiah is reminding us that this king child, this Messiah, everything rests on his shoulders. And see, that's where we find rest. So what do we see? What do we see in the Christmas story? I want you to turn now to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And just the first 12 verses. Here we have the, the, the wise men coming to visit Jesus. Now, what we typically think, I, I hope I don't want to burst any bubbles, we typically think there's only three wise men because they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and... All right, kids, I may call on you to, to help me tell that story in a couple weeks, and maybe even today some. Uh, but there would have been numerous wise men. There would have been an entire entourage uh, of Arab wise men and their, their folks that would have been coming... Uh, to Jerusalem and they're looking for this child king that had been prophesied look at verse 1 now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king behold wise men from the where is he who has been born king of the Jews for we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. 
For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. Kids, help me out. They offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Come on, kids, I'm going to give you another chance. They offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Excellent. From the corner over here. Thank you. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So here these wise men, having understood the prophecy from Isaiah, they recognize that he is a mighty God, everlasting Father. In fact, they use some terminology that help us understand what this mighty God, everlasting Father is. One, they call him a king. They say, where is this king of the Jews? They call him a ruler, that he will rule the world. And they call him shepherd. Pretty amazing. See, one of the primary... uh, uh, when, when we uh, understand into what we have for a king is one who is sovereign. So when we talk about a mighty God, an everlasting father, a ruler, a king, a shepherd, we're talking about one who is sovereign in every way. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. And these wise men recognize that. And they said, we want to come hundreds of miles at our own expense in order to worship this one true king. These guys were in demand, folks. I mean, the very fact that Herod heard, Herod, uh, the king at the time, heard that they were coming to town and said, hey, I need to talk with you. If you're summoned by the king, you're in high demand. But they were headed to find this Christ child, this Christ child. So for us to have the best Christmas ever, we've got to pursue as our priority this Christ child even today. One of the things that gets in our way is busyness, right? Busyness is the arch enemy of connection. Busyness is the arch enemy of connection. So what do we learn from Isaiah chapter 9, Matthew chapter 2 as it relates to this? How do we eliminate busyness in our life so that we can rest in the one true king? Busyness is the arch enemy of connection. A couple things, real quick. Just practically, we need to remove time robbers. We need to remove time robbers. Now, how much time do you spend on your phone, social media? I mean, I know we got to check out what everybody's wearing at the Christmas party on Facebook, right? Like, we got to check out the Instagram stories because people are so much more interesting at Christmas, right? But we spend so much time, games and and email, social media. In fact, they say that you may be addicted to your phone if you get phantom rings in your pocket. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, some of you are like, no, I don't know. I know you know. Like, you're walking through a store, and you, you think that your leg is buzzing, and you pick up your phone, and nobody called you. That's a phantom ring. Or, or, or you're at home or sitting in your office, and you think you heard your, your phone ring, and you pull it out of your pocket, and you, nobody called you. That's a phantom ring. You may be addicted, right? Yeah, but we need to just practically eliminate some of those time robbers that we have. Eliminate some of those unnecessary extras. And then uh, we need to do more cookies, we need to do more decorations, more shopping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you need to ask yourself at the expense of what? 
Is it at the expense of connecting? And here's why this is so important, because all of these things reduce margin in our life. Is that healthy margin leads us to loving people well. Loving those people in relationships well. See, people in a hurry don't love well. They don't have time, because love takes time, right? So we run past some of those relationships that are so important. See, one of the enemy's greatest weapons is exhaustion. Because he knows that when we're emotionally and spiritually and physically tired, we're irritable, we're easily triggered, we make snap decisions, we revert to what uh, is easiest for us to do, we take shortcuts. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to stop prioritizing. You hear me say this all the time. We have to stop prioritizing our schedule and schedule our priorities. You see, for the, for the wise men, they recognized that the chief priority that they had was visiting this child king. And they went to whatever expense, whatever time, and all, and they brought, again, they brought an entourage full of relationships to expose themselves and to those they love to this child king. So a question you may want to ask yourself is, are you scheduling for who you want to become? or what you want to accomplish? Are you scheduling for who you want to become or what you want to accomplish? You see, if what you're busy with has become your master, then we're just practicing idolatry. And we always reflect what we idolatrize. Again, we often do more activity than our relationships can sustain. And when that happens, all of our relationships, our primary relationship with the King of Kings and our relationship with those that He's placed around us end up suffering. You know, it's true too that busyness just can make us physically and spiritually sick. In fact, if you're constantly busy, that's probably a symptom that you're already sick. That there's already a problem. You see, busyness in our lives points, if it's consistent, always points to a deeper problem. That may be pervasive, people-pleasing, restless ambition. I mean, busyness uh, always serves as a reassurance or, or a hedge against our own personal emptiness. You know, oftentimes we'll say, you know, obviously uh, my life is not trivial or meaningless because I'm always busy all the time. But the reality is, is, if you're busy, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're faithful or fruitful. It just means that you're busy. And again, God gave us the gift of rest, the gift of Sabbath. And for us to have the best Christmas ever, to really appreciate this child king, then we need to rest in him who's primary. You know, parents... You know, one of the questions I'd encourage you to ask, are you scheduling your kids for accomplishment and fame or for holiness and wholeness? You know, when we overschedule these type of things in our kids' lives, uh, one, we don't have time to model what wholeness and holiness look like. But oftentimes, we're just too busy checking off boxes for our kids to actually relate to them well. And listen, if we're more interested in accomplishment than personhood, whether that's for our kids or for ourselves, then you've got to ask the question, what's missing? What's missing? What, what does it say about me that I'm frequently overwhelmed? Uh, what do I need to learn about myself? What biblical promises am I not believing? What divine commands am I ignoring? What self-imposed commands am I obeying that I should ignore? So, we scheduling for who we want to become or what we want to accomplish. And then lastly is this, is resting in God's sovereignty leads us to appreciate Christ's supremacy. I know that's a mouthful. Resting in God's sovereignty leads us to appreciate Christ's supremacy. Isaiah told us that he is a mighty God, everlasting Father. 
the wisest of men of the day recognized that Jesus, this Messiah, this child, was king, he was ruler, and he was shepherd. See, a reality for us is this, is we are either putting everything on our shoulders or his. And that will determine whether we have the best Christmas ever or if we just get caught up again in the machine that it's become. Again, I love this picture of these magi, these wise men. Here this hundreds of these Arab, wise Arab men and their families have come from the east. Great expense. Man, living in the desert is not easy. I mean, I've never lived there. I'm just, I hear it's tough. They would have spent months to get to their destination. But these guys are also, as we said earlier, they're in high demand. King Herod wants an audience with them. I mean, usually it's the other way around. You know, we want an audience with the king. Tell the king what we think about him, right? But the king said, I want to know what you guys know. And yet, their priority continue to be this child king despite all the trappings around them and they didn't have the social media stuff going on they didn't have you know uh, they didn't have 6,000 Hallmark movies that you have to keep up with right I don't keep up with them but they were in high demand and they still chose to make Jesus king so would we prioritize our schedule this Christmas so that we can appreciate the supremacy of Christ in the birth 